Welcome back. We're going to get started here with chapter 28. We're going to talk hematologic and renal emergencies. This chapter is going to cover hematologic system or blood. It's also going to cover the renal system with the kidneys. With the hematologic system, we're dealing with blood. And although blood may not be thought of as an organ, it really is its own organ system and it has a lot of functions that it needs to do. One function is that it helps to control bleeding. It develops clots to stop bleeding, whether that's internal or external. It helps to deliver oxygen to all the cells of the body. It removes carbon dioxide and other waste products from the body uh, that have circulated and again, helps to get those to the proper organs for filtration. When we talk about blood, it's important to know that there are solids that are in the blood as well as the liquid component. The liquid component is known as plasma and it's relatively viscous. It's kind of thick. It's not real runny like water, um, but it helps to move the cells and the platelets the waste products and all of those things through the circulatory system. Red blood cells are those hemoglobin molecules that help carry oxygen to the cells of our body. White blood cells help to fight infection. And platelets are those pieces within the blood that aid in clotting or controlling bleeding. Medications can affect these components of blood there are also external forces that can control these uh, levels, if you will. So it's important to kind of get a good history on all of your patients to know if the makeup of their blood is normal or if maybe they have higher risks for certain incidents because of their medications or their environment. As I said, the platelets within the blood are responsible for clotting aggregation of platelets, when they all come together and stick together, is the body's most rapid and that initial response to help control bleeding. Clotting factors are a group of proteins that are produced in the liver and they are floating around in the bloodstream as well. Once these are activated, the clotting factors form clots through a clotting cascade. And so these chemical messengers are sent through the blood and it tells the platelets and the fibrinogen to go to this particular area and it starts sticking and forming this large clump of platelets, which in turn then seals the hole. But there are problems with clotting factors for some individuals. These coagulopathies mean abnormal clotting of the blood. So we have patients who are more prone to poor clot formation or poor clotting. Um, when this occurs, the body forms clots too slowly, but we also have issues when the body forms clots too quickly. And so certain diseases may make these patients have complications or issues with their body's clotting ability. This includes liver disease, because again, we have those uh, chemical messengers and that release from the liver that help to create blood clots, hemophilia, and von Wildebrand disease also can cause issues with patients having trouble forming clots. As you work in the medical field, you are going to learn more about certain conditions and how they affect the body. And there's always new medications that are being created that patients are on. So we're gonna learn a lot of those things as you go throughout your career. However, there are some conditions and some medications that it's probably really good for you to know now. So know that we're trying to identify potential patients that have coagulopathies and we're gonna get a good history on them. Certain medical conditions that the patient tells us they have may help us to understand 
that patient's ability to form clots. We also get a list of medications, right? It's part of our sample history is getting the medications that the patient is on. And we are gonna be paying special attention to those blood thinners. Blood thinners basically cause the plasma to be less viscous and the platelets to be less sticky so that they do not form clots as easily. These patients are gonna be more prone to life-threatening bleeds even with minor injuries. And a simple fall in hitting their head may lead to death if there is bleeding on the brain that does not get addressed. So let's identify these patients that have coagulopathies. If we have a patient that we are being presented with, with any type of trauma or other potential cause for bleeding, we really need to be careful with them. Take your appropriate standard precautions. Perform your primary assessment and care for any immediate life threats. These are your ABCs. And then obtain a history from the patient. Identify those things that might be specific to blood thinning medication or a past medical history that tells us they are at risk for bleeding. Make sure you notify the hospital so that they can be prepared for this patient when you get them there. A patient with a potential bleeding issue is going to need to be addressed quickly so that that bleeding can be controlled if the body is unable to do it on its own. Throughout the course of our time with the patient, we need to continually monitor them for any signs of deterioration, signs of shock, signs of decreasing mental status. If the patient is losing blood, they're essentially losing red blood cells. And it's important that we try to get them as much oxygen as we can. So supplemental oxygen for any patient who looks like they may be in shock or may have that decreased mental status is going to be important. And then let's get this patient to an appropriate receiving hospital. One of the blood disorders that you should be familiar with is anemia. Anemia is a lack of the normal amount of red blood cells in circulation. And anemia is extremely dangerous because red blood cells carry oxygen. So acute anemia is when someone has a sudden loss of blood. Chronic anemia, however, can occur to individuals on a regular basis where we have females with heavy menstrual flows, we have slow GI bleeding. This can happen a lot with elderly patients. They have some intestinal ulcerations or even patients who have stomach ulcers. They can bleed very slowly and through slow chronic bleeding, they can develop anemia. Um, but a disease is also affecting bone marrow or the production and structure of the hemoglobin molecule can be cause for anemia. A particular type of anemia that you should be familiar with is sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell anemia is genetic and it's gonna be passed down from the parents. We used to see this most often in patients of African descent, um, but keep in mind that you cannot tell by someone's physical appearance if they have African descent. So you need to ask everybody all of those questions about their history. And if we're concerned with bleeding um, or if they inform you that they have a history of sickle cell anemia, we need to understand what that is. With sickle cell anemia, what happens is we actually change the shape of the red blood cell. So this is a defective shape. It resembles a sickle, it's kind of curved. There's a picture in your textbook on page 769 if you'd like to see that sickle shape. But these cells, these red blood cells have a shorter lifespan and they cannot carry oxygen as well as a normal red blood cell. And if you look at the shape of this, they also, because they're not round and smooth, they can cause some clotting issues 
because they get hung up on each other and they can create a, th a thrombus or basically a blockage within a vessel. So again, because of this shape and its inability to function, the red blood cells can cause some complications. They can cause damage to the spleen because the spleen is one of those big reservoirs for blood. Sickle pain crisis. Because of the shape of these red blood cells, these patients having a sickle crisis have extreme pain especially in their abdomen and in their joints. Acute chest syndrome, chest pain. Priapism, which is a prolonged erection. And yes, this can be quite painful as well. Stroke or a thrombus, a blockage of blood flow to the brain. And jaundice, which has to do with the liver and blockages that are created within the liver. Now keep in mind, sickle cell anemia is genetic. Um, it's estimated that one in 13 individuals of African-American descent has the sickle cell trait. Now, the sickle cell trait doesn't always lead to these complications. These individuals can lead a normal life if they just carry the trait. However, when they choose to have babies and they reproduce, they can pass along that trait or if their partner also has the trait and they both pass along the trait, their child may actually have sickle cell anemia, even though neither parent actually has anemia, they just are carriers. Now with our patients with sickle cell anemia, keep in mind that the red blood cell is not going to function properly and so we need to kind of address those concerns that we're going to have um, due to the red blood cell not functioning as it normally would. So we know it can't carry oxygen as easily, so we may want to give the patient some oxygen. We want to watch for any inadequate respirations from the patient. Look for signs of hypoperfusion. Because of this shape, if we have thrombus formation and the sickle cells are sticking together, then we may need to uh, think about potential stroke or um, acute coronary syndromes, get these patients to a center that is able to care for them based off of your assessment and their history. Okay, we're moving on to the renal system now. Um, this will follow along uh, in your textbook as well. So here with the renal system, we're talking about the production of urine. The renal system itself is made up of two kidneys located in that retroperitoneal space, one on the right and one on the left. And the kidneys then extend down to ureters. Those ureters lead to the bladder and the bladder leads to the urethra, which is how urine is then excreted from the body. The kidneys are essential for life as we know it. The kidneys are the filter of the blood and really they work to maintain homeostasis by getting rid of any waste products that may be in the blood. It get, the kidneys get rid of excess salts, gets rid of excess fluid, and helps to maintain that fluid balance, acid-base balance within the body. If we didn't have the kidneys pulling that waste out and then creating urine to excrete it, then we would basically become toxic and we cannot live without some type of filter. So as we go through this chapter, we'll talk about the kidneys a little bit, um, but we'll talk about when the kidneys fail as well. The renal system is interesting because depending on what is happening, you can have different parts of the renal system that are affected. You're gonna see different signs and symptoms when that occurs. Some of these things may be very minor, but some of them may be life-threatening. One of the more common issues that we see with the renal system 
are urinary tract infections or UTIs. This is when we get bacteria into the urethra. It travels up to the bladder. Usually it stopped here because the patient will begin having symptoms and they are likely to go see someone and get treated for those symptoms. The symptoms typically include pain with urination, increased urinary frequency, increased urgency. Um, patients find themselves going smaller amounts more frequently. But if these UTIs are left untreated, that bacteria can continue to spread. It can actually travel up the ureters and to the kidneys. This is then called pyelonephritis, and it's a much more serious situation. Kidney stones are also known as renal calculi. These kidney stones can be made up of different things, but usually they are made of calcium and they're formed within the kidney. So a lot of times when they're in the kidney, the patient really has no symptoms. They don't even probably even realize that they're there unless they've had some CT scan or something done that shows them there. But in the kidney themselves, they don't typically cause any problems. Now, they can begin to dislodge and move as they travel into the ureter and try to get their way out of the body. As they dislodge and begin to enter the ureter, the patient is likely to feel severe pain. This is unilateral, meaning they're gonna feel it on the side where the stone is trying to travel, and it's going to be on the flank or kind of on the back, but on the side where the stone is located. Patients sometimes will even complain of nausea and vomiting because the pain is so intense. Urinary catheters are not just for patients in the hospital. Um, there are other patients that you may encounter that have urinary catheters. They may have these because of some type of obstruction where they can't urinate normally or a neurologic disorder where the nerves and the sphincter of the bladder don't function properly. So instead of having issues of incontinence, they have a urinary catheter. These patients use urinary catheters to drain the bladder, get rid of urine, and urine is a waste product. Commonly, that's inserted through the urethra, which is normally where we would have urine exit anyways. But sometimes if there's issues with the urethra or with that um, part of the patient's body, there may be a catheter that enters through the skin down near the pubic bone. Complications of urinary catheters um, most of the time is a urinary tract infection, um, but sometimes there can be trauma to these sites as well. Um, patients can pull their urinary catheter out, and if you've ever seen a catheter, there's a little balloon that gets blown up after it's inserted, so that balloon can cause a lot of trauma if it's pulled through the urethra before it's deflated. Um, and so if you have a patient who's having pain or an issue with their catheter, um, we're going to leave that catheter in place, but we are going to transfer that patient to a facility where they can be evaluated further. Remember the kidneys are a filter and that filter is going to help remove things from our body that we don't need and then we excrete it in the urine. Well, renal failure occurs when the kidneys aren't able to do that. Acute failure typically results from shock, hypoperfusion, or some type of toxic ingestion. Something has gotten into the body that's actually poisoning the kidneys. Some patients do develop a chronic renal failure. This could be inherited or it could be secondary to some other disease state that they've had that has not been managed well. Um, and specifically, someone who has diabetes or high blood pressure, if they are not managing those disease states because of the high blood sugar that they encounter with diabetes or because of the high pressure within the vascular space with hypertension, it can actually cause damage to the kidneys themselves 
and over time the kidneys will slowly fail until they no longer function. That period of time where we say the kidneys no longer function is known as end stage renal disease, ESRD. This is irreversible. Once end stage has begun, we cannot fix the kidney. So what happens? The patient needs to go on dialysis. And dialysis is another means for the blood to be filtered and that waste products that have usually been collected and excreted by the kidneys are dealt with through dialysis. Dialysis can be done through hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis is where the patient has their blood actually pumped out of their body. It runs through a filter and then it's pumped back into their body. Usually takes a couple of hours. They may have to do it several times a week um, in order to stay well. Peritoneal dialysis, on the other hand, is something that many patients do at home. They may do it overnight, every single night, because again, we have to get this waste product out of the body, um, but it's actually done through the abdomen using the visceral and parietal layers, uh, membranes of the abdominal area as the filter. So the patient pumps fluid into their abdomen and then it removes that fluid the next day and when they remove that extra fluid, those waste products have collected in that fluid, so they're able to get rid of them. 90% receive hemodialysis in specialized centers. We've got dialysis centers all over now, and I will tell you that after receiving dialysis, many patients may actually feel weak or very tired, and you may get calls to the dialysis center to take care of patients and transport them to the hospital. I kind of alluded to this earlier, but with renal failure, these patients need to have dialysis and um, understand this is not easy. You think you're busy now, um, try working this into your schedule. But you've got 450,000 Americans that are on dialysis. They go to these dialysis treatment centers um, they may go for three treatments a week. These treatments last from three to four hours. Again, some patients go more frequently and they spend less time than hooked up to the machine each time, but it all kind of equals out to a lot of time doing this in these specialized dialysis uh, centers. Only about 8% treat themselves at home. Um, we talk about hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis. We see a lot more complications and um, issues with sepsis with peritoneal dialysis. So patients tend to prefer the hemodialysis over peritoneal. Um, End-stage renal disease patients often rely on EMS to transport them. Um, no, we do not typically take them to and from dialysis in this area, but if you work somewhere else, you may be not just a 911 service, but a transport service, and that may be part of the job that you do. Hemodialysis, again, is where the patient is going to go to a dialysis center and be hooked up to a machine. This machine um, is going to remove the blood from the patient, run it through those specialized filters, and then return it back into the patient. So it is going to require two large, basically IV catheters, one to pull the blood out and the other to put the blood back in. This image is also in your textbook on page 774. Um, you can see we have one line where the blood is being pumped out and it is going through an arterial pressure monitor. It's going through the blood pump we're watching um, with this whole process that there's no air or any other potential infectious material or toxins or anything getting into the blood. So it's not gonna be contaminated once we pump it back into the patient. And 
Then it goes back into the patient after it's run through the filtration and all of those waste products have been removed. Also, you can see two pictures in your textbook. They're coming up in the slideshow as well. Um, but there are two types of access for us to have patients do their dialysis. One is a two port catheter and that is usually using a larger vessel in the chest or um, upper arm shoulder area. But we also have an AV fistula and this is an arterial venous fistula. And what this is, is we actually take an artery and a vein and we fuse them in a surgical procedure. Now, that doesn't sound right because arteries carry oxygenated blood, veins don't, um, and we don't usually mix the two, right? But this creates a larger vessel. There's more blood flow through this area. And if you see this kind of larger, gnarly looking area on a patient's forearm or even upper arm, um, that fistula, you'll be able to actually feel it and you'll feel the churning of the blood underneath. It's not a normal pulse that you would anticipate. You can even listen with a stethoscope over that area and you should again hear that um, churning or we call it a thrill. Here you can see your two port catheter for hemodialysis. They're coming off of the chest. Here is your AV fistula or arterial venous fistula where we have surgically connected that artery and vein. Um, it's very raised. There's a lot of pressure through here um, from the turbulence of the blood flow, but this allows us to easily identify and hook the patient up to that hemodialysis. Now, I want to strongly caution you that if you see an AV fistula on a patient, stay away from that extremity. Do not use that arm for blood pressures. Do not use that arm for anything. You're gonna treat that as if it's off limits because this AV fistula is the patient's lifeline, right? If they don't get their hemodialysis, their body is going to be overrun by the toxins the kidneys would have typically filtered out. And if we can't use this for hemodialysis, they can essentially die. So don't use an arm that has a fistula. Moving on and talking a little bit more about peritoneal dialysis. This is where we use the peritoneal cavity um, in order to filter waste products from the body. So special fluid is infused into the abdominal cavity. It's left there for several hours. Again, many patients will do this overnight. And essentially, kind of through diffusion, the body says, you know, we've got a lesser concentration in this fluid than that fluid. So it sends the waste products over and the waste products then and this special fluid help to absorb that waste. And then the fluid is removed from the abdominal cavity and discarded. There are different ways the peritoneal dialysis can be done. So continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, which just uses gravity to help exchange that fluid several times a day, or patients can do the continuous um, sickler assisted peritoneal dialysis, CCPD. Um, but with this, you have a machine that's hooked up to the patient at night, and this will fill and empty the abdominal cavity, again, while the patient sleeps. In this image, you can see the peritoneal dialysis catheter. It's also on page 776 in your textbook but this little catheter is left in place and then that gives us uh, the ability to infuse that special fluid for the peritoneal dialysis and then we can hook it up to a pump and remove that fluid once it has done its cycle. So patients who are in end-stage renal disease, ESRD, 
they can have medical emergencies occur, um, but we kind of break them into two groups. Some occur because of the loss of normal kidney function, and other emergencies occur because of complications or issues that they have with the dialysis itself. So many dialysis patients have other underlying diseases. Remember we said one of the main reasons patients go into renal failure is because of uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension. So when you have these other underlying issues, going through dialysis isn't necessarily a cakewalk. Um, it can cause a, you know, an upset of other bodily systems as well. Please keep in mind that dialysis is this person's lifeline. So we see complications of end-stage renal disease um, with patients who have missed dialysis appointments. These patients usually are having signs and symptoms similar to that of congestive heart failure. So when we think about congestive heart failure, we think of swelling. This person's got excess fluid that they haven't been able to get rid of. They have electrolyte disturbances, imbalances. So they might be feeling palpitations with their heart. They might be having muscle cramping. Um, but again, dialysis would have helped to adjust those electrolyte levels. The patient may also experience shortness of breath and shortness of breath is likely due to that excess fluid and excess fluid potentially entering the lungs, causing crackling sounds when we auscultate the lungs. So if we're being called to care for a patient that we have identified as an ESRD patient, we need to find out when was their last dialysis? Have they missed any appointments? We want to do our normal assessment as far as our primary assessment with our ABCs. We want to get a set of vitals, put the patient in a position of comfort, think about providing them some oxygen. Maybe we can use our CPAP. Remember, CPAP is that continuous positive airway pressure. And CPAP can be utilized when we've got crackles in the lungs so that the patient might be able to breathe a little more easily. Be sure you're watching those vital signs and we're looking for any trends in the vital signs. Because of the electrolyte imbalances, we wanna have the AED ready. This can cause some of this, the dysrhythmias that cause the heart rate to do funny things. And we wanna be prepared should we need to become more aggressive with this patient. Now, these patients are gonna be going to the emergency department, but if we have a facility that does dialysis within their institution, that's gonna be our best option for the majority of these patients. They really need to be stabilized and they're going to require dialysis shortly after their arrival to help to do that. So we've got dialysis complications that can occur as well that we may be needing to care for patients. Um, one of the things that we see is bleeding from that AV fistula site. And remember, this is that area that's under a great deal of pressure. And so when we have bleeding from that site, it's hard for a clot to form when you have that much pressure in that area. But if a clot forms, that's also a problem because if there's a blockage of that AV fistula, we can no longer use it for dialysis. Patients can also get bacterial infections of the blood um, if there's contamination during their hemodialysis. So it's important that these dialysis centers use very sterile aseptic techniques to prevent any contamination, as I mentioned, those filters and all of that um, are well cleaned and that whole process is monitored very closely. So um, we are understanding that yes, you can get bacterial infections in the blood. You can also get infections called peritonitis through the peritoneal dialysis as well. So if we are called to one of the dialysis centers for a patient who's having some complications, after their dialysis, um, 
we're going to treat them the same as most any other patient by doing our primary assessment and correcting any life threats. One of those potential life threats could be bleeding. And if we need to control bleeding, we're going to use direct pressure on the area. We're going to use some elevation. Um, if we have a hemostatic dressing, we might be able to apply that. A hemostatic dressing is a dressing that's been treated with blood clotting um, components and it helps to stimulate clot formation. If we cannot control the bleeding by any of these other means, we may have to put a tourniquet on the patient. Remember, this AV fistula is under a lot of pressure. It's going to be hard to form a clot. And because it's larger, these patients can lose a great deal of blood in a short amount of time. So we need to make sure that we're controlling that bleeding. And if we cannot get it to stop, we put a tourniquet on there and we prevent blood flow to that extremity. Administer some oxygen to your patient. Try and keep them comfortable. Treat your patient for shock. Um, and one of the big things with these dialysis complications, your patient may feel cold. So trying to keep them supine and putting a blanket or a warm blanket on them is gonna help to keep them comfortable um, and hopefully will ease some of their anxiety. If peritonitis is suspected, we need to transport the dialysis fluid from the peritoneal dialysis with them. And that's important because we're gonna be able to run lab tests on that fluid to determine what type of bacteria we might be dealing with. And yes, some patients are gonna be lucky enough to get a kidney transplant. Understand that these patients who are receiving kidney transplants have likely done dialysis, many of them for years before they were able to get a kidney. Um, but kidneys are the most commonly transplanted organs. There are about 21,000 transplants done each year. These patients spend their lives on medications to prevent rejection of that kidney. And because of these medications, they are gonna be more susceptible to other types of infections because these medications will reduce their body's immune system and the ability to fight off even simple infections sometimes. Okay, doing a little bit of review here now. Um, think about blood, blood goes round and round, right? It carries oxygen to the cells as well as removing carbon dioxide and other waste products from the blood. The blood is made up of cells, platelets, and plasma. Those cells are red and white blood cells. Red blood cells help with oxygen carrying to all the other cells of the body. White blood cells are part of our immune system and help with dealing with infection. Platelets are the component of the blood that help to control bleeding by developing clots. And plasma is the liquid portion of the blood that helps all of these cells and platelets to float along. Anemia is a deficiency of red blood cells within the circulation. This can be due to poor production of red blood cells, it can be due to loss of red blood cells, or it can be due to disease states such as sickle cell anemia, where we have a red blood cell that is not the correct shape and therefore cannot function as a normal red blood cell. Remember, sickle cell is genetic, so it's an inherited disease, and this misshape causes movement of these red blood cells to sometimes stick together, called sludging, or create blockages in smaller vessels. Um, and these patients in sickle cell crisis really need to get to a hospital so that their pain can be managed and they can be treated appropriately. We talked about the renal system today, and we know we've got two kidneys, two ureters, that all leads to one bladder and one urethra. The kidneys are a filter for the blood. They remove waste products, 
including excess fluid, excess electrolytes and salts. Infection can occur within the renal system. This can be a urinary tract infection, which is quite common, or it can even progress to pyelonephritis, which is a kidney infection. We know kidney stones are produced in the kidneys and can lead to intense pain and complications with blockages of the ureters. Renal failure is also a potential problem that we see within the renal system. Renal failure is a condition in which the kidneys are not able to perform their normal duties. Now keep in mind, you do have two kidneys. You really only need one to survive. And based off of the kidney function, um, if patients are in renal failure, they usually have a provider who's following them along and helping to identify how severe their situation is and if and when dialysis needs to be started. Dialysis is the process of um, doing basically what the kidneys are supposed to do when they don't work, removing that excess fluid, electrolytes, and other waste products from the blood. Dialysis can be performed through hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. We've talked about each of those a little bit. Hemodialysis many times is done in a dialysis center, and it's done a few times a week. Peritoneal dialysis is typically done at home and is either done several times a day or overnight. In end-stage renal disease, one of the big things we see is patients missing or skipping their dialysis treatments. The problem is they are overrun with that excess fluid and basically can become toxic because of their inability to remove those waste products. Patients also can get infections or have issues of bleeding, um, uncontrolled bleeding from that hemodialysis excess site. Remember those pieces of the blood and what they do. Abnormal blood cells can significantly affect patients. And we know the renal system is extremely important in maintaining homeostasis, balancing that acid base within the body. Renal failure can be chronic or acute. And end-stage renal disease is managed through dialysis and sometimes then through kidney transplant. Don't forget to get a good history from the patient. Sometimes asking them, oh, have you had any surgeries, will help to identify some of that significant medical history. If you see unusual scarring um, that looks like a surgical incision, if you see a lumpy, bumpy vein like running up their arm, ask them about it. Most of these patients know their medical history pretty darn well because if they have sickle cell or if they are in ESRD, um, they've seen a lot of providers over the years. Okay, here's your critical thinking question. You have a patient who's transported routinely for dialysis like three times a week. Uh, she's been sick and so she canceled her trip yesterday She's calling the ambulance today saying she can't breathe. She feels like she's going to die. Is it possible that she has a legitimate complaint after missing her dialysis by only one day? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and keep in mind, you know, with these patients, the activities that they've done up to that point in time are going to influence the amount of waste products and extra fluid that they've maybe encountered. So. Um, absolutely, this is definitely an emergent situation. We need to get to that patient. We need to maybe begin some treatment with some oxygen or even our CPAP and get that patient to the hospital where they can receive dialysis and hopefully correct some of these issues that they're having. All right, that's it for chapter 28. You guys will be getting ready for trauma. Good luck.